from Spotify Studios and Built It Productions, it's The Rewind, a show about artists and musicians and how they became the person we all recognize today. I'm Guy Raz, and on this episode, singer and songwriter Sean Mendez. Were you nervous at all? You've never shaking, performed, right? Of course, shaking and nerves, but it was so exhilarating to, to think that this many people care. Did people ask for your autograph? Yeah. Was it weird? Photos and... Because you were like a high school student who was just like coming... It is just as weird as you imagine it. Uh-huh. That's what it is. Every time somebody asks and they go, how crazy is it all this is happening? And I go, imagine it. That's what it is. It's not more confusing than that. There's nothing I know that you don't. It's just crazy. So there are some stories that seem so implausible, so outlandish, so unlikely that they're hard to believe. They almost seem like the work of fiction cooked up by a novelist or a screenwriter. You know, someone who stretches the limits of reality to give us an escape from our own reality. Well, today's story is that and much, much more because the facts are wildly implausible, except they are all true. At age 14, in the summer of 2013, Sean Mendez, who was an ordinary kid living in a suburb outside Toronto, Canada, recorded a six-second clip of himself singing a Justin Bieber song in his bedroom. He then posted that video on a social media app called Vine, and within a few days, tens of thousands of people watched it. And by the following summer, Sean Mendez was working on a record. By the summer of 2015, this is just two years after he posted that Vine video, Sean Mendez was opening up for Taylor Swift on her North American concert tour. And by the age of 19, he became a bona fide superstar in his own right, the third youngest artist in history to have three number one albums. Only Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber were younger when they accomplished the same thing. But what's even more incredible is that Sean didn't even pick up a guitar until the age of 13. And even then, he learned how to play by watching YouTube tutorials. And at that time, and this is around 2012, Sean was just another middle school kid in Pickering, Ontario. And he says he grew up in a house where music was always playing. Yeah, it was kind of just like, neither of my parents play music or not many people in my family do, but they love music. They're huge music lovers. To walk into my house and there was music playing was normal. Um, All of my parents' friends are West Indian and Jamaican. So there was always tons of, you know, reggae music playing in the house at a really young age. My parents loved it. My mom was a dance teacher back in England. And so it was a mixture of like reggae and then my dad would be blasting Rolling Stones every Saturday morning and my mom would be blasting Shania Twain and Garth Brooks, you know, at nighttime. And it was kind of this all day music was playing in the house thing. You grew up in a town called Pickering in Ontario in in, outside of Toronto, right? Yeah, yeah. Pickering, Ontario. Um, And are you like a full on, were you like a full on Canadian kid, like playing hockey and... Yeah, I mean, I started quite old for a Canadian kid. We usually started like nine months. Uh-huh, right. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I, I started when I was like 13 and uh, my parents were super supportive. You know, when I, when I first started playing soccer, I was like, I want to be in the World Cup. Mm-hmm. When I started playing hockey, I wanted to play in the NHL. Like, and it was always, I wanted to do it as a dream. And they were like, okay, let's do it all the way. Did you, like, did you listen to pop music? As a kid, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think like around 13, 14, when I found a huge interest in like Bruno Mars, Justin Bieber, Usher, Chris Brown, was when I was like, really started to really love pop music and think that I wanted to, to sing that type of style. Did you, would you stand in front of the mirror with a, a hairbrush and sing? <laughs> I, I didn't. I was, same time around that time was when Ed Sheeran um, started to surface in North America. Yeah. And, I, and I saw this video of him with an acoustic guitar. Do you remember what song? I think, well... The first song he was doing was like a loop. He was in the studio and he was singing like an old uh, folk song yeah. on on loop of his voice. And then I saw another one of him playing the A-team. Um, and I was, to me, the coolest thing ever was just to be able to play an acoustic guitar and to sing with it. So I, I think you were like 13 when you picked up a guitar for the first time. Yeah. H- how did that happen? Um, my dad had this old classical guitar that he was given as a gift in my house with 
broken strings and out of tune and I didn't know how to tune it. And I kind of just messed around on that for a couple of weeks. And then I asked him if we could get a guitar and we rented one. And he's like, if we rent a guitar and you can learn how to play it in a couple of weeks, we'll get you a guitar. So how, how did you learn? YouTube. YouTube? Yeah. You like went on YouTube and you typed in how to play the guitar? Yeah, basically. <laughs> I mean, no, it was more like I was saying before, it's more like how to play the 18 by Ed Sheeran. Okay. And how to play Grenade by Bruno Mars. So and, you would watch like fingers, like close up of fingers on chords? Yeah. yeah. Put your finger here, here, and here, and that's a G chord. And, and there you go. So, so you didn't have like any formal guitar lessons or, or voice lessons? Yeah, no, totally. I didn't play, I didn't have any lessons. I think like the thing is about music and not only music, but everything which I've really learned is that it sucks to learn it at somebody else's pace. Whether that's too fast for you or too slow for you, you know? And I, I took one guitar lesson and he wanted to teach me scales. And I was like, I just want to know how to play Ed Sheeran, the A-team. <laughs> and he was like, well, that's not what we're going to do today. And I was like, well, I'm leaving because that's where I want to learn how to play it. And I remember I left and I went home and I went on YouTube and that was my way of learning. And then I could learn as many songs I wanted to learn a day and the songs I wanted to learn. And it was really, that's how I did it. And what would you do? Would You, you would sit in your bedroom just watching the videos and just trying to work work through it pretty much it was like every day i'd be in that my bedroom for like six hours what was it that captured your imagination about the guitar i mean i've got two kids yeah. to get them to practice violin is really hard we got to like force them to do it I, well what? try giving them guitar or, or like <laughs> drums or something like may, maybe i think what happens is when you see an instrument be glorified like guitar and you see like guitar heroes Jimi hendrix on stage it's really easy to want to be them that's what you wanted to do well, yeah, I mean, and actually, for me, it was a lot less about electric guitar. I actually didn't think I would ever play electric guitar at that age. I thought it was all going to be acoustic. I wanted to be Ed Sheeran. And then I started to get into John Mayer, you know, about 15, 16 years old, realized that electric guitar is the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I started learning that. But where do you think you got the discipline to sit in your room and watch YouTube videos? Because everybody who picks up a guitar sucks at yeah, first. There's no, there's no human on earth. Like Jimi Hendrix sucked, yeah, of right? Course. And it's it's frustrating. It's hard. It's a lot of work. Like, where do you think you found the discipline? To do it? Yeah. I just wanted to. I think when you want something that bad, it's the only thing you can kind of think about. And at 15, I had nothing else to think about but just to be better at guitar. Were you also singing along? Yeah, definitely. I was singing before that, and I kind of used the guitar as a tool to enhance my singing, you know? Um, and you just loved singing. Yeah, I just loved to sing. And, and I, I'm not, I, this sounds so silly to say, but the truth is when I first started, I was pretty bad at singing, honestly. Genuinely not good. Um, and I was just so obsessed with it that I would watch videos and study them, and I would replay one part of the song, and then I would sing it then I wouldn't sound like it. And I would do that a hundred times until the hundredth time I sounded like them. Hmm. And then I would move on. You know what I mean? It was like this big mimic game for me. How do I sound exactly like, you know, Usher in the song? And I think that's kind of what taught me to sing. So I think it, it was in sort of early 2013 that um, you discovered this social media app called Vine. And for people who don't remember Vine, Vine, how would you? It's a, it was an app that you would post like six and a half second video clips on. And I was so lucky that I, for some reason, had the thought of posting uh, me singing on it, which was... You had like an iPhone? Yeah, I had an iPhone. And, you know, at the time it was a lot of comedy and like little like funny like comedy skits. Yeah. And um, nobody was doing music. But there was a music category, right? And, you know, whatever the most liked thing on the music category would jump up to the top of that, you know, very quickly because there wasn't a lot of music on it. Yeah. I had an idea and I got my sister to film me. Hey, I think you, you posted a video in July of 2013. It was, yeah. it was you singing a six second clip of a, of a Justin Bieber song. Yeah, as long as you love me. And like, well, you just sat down in your room with a, with a guitar and your sister filmed it? Yeah. I'll be a soldier. So you just posted this thing on Vine and, and you're like an anonymous guy from Pickering, Canada. Yeah, which wasn't weird to me because a year before that, I started posting YouTube covers. And was anyone watching them? 500 people max, you know, my most watched video. And it was more for friends. And I remember, you know, putting it on Facebook and friends commenting and that being the cool part of it. That was just so cool to me. Yeah. Vine took everything to the next level. What 
happened with once you posted that Vine video, the Justin Bieber cover? I don't know, man. I have no idea. Something caught fire. It took off overnight. I woke up the next day. The thing had like 10,000 likes on it. The next day? Yeah, and I deleted the app. (laughs) Because you were freaked out? Terrified. You were like, oh my God, 10,000 people have seen this. I remember my friend was on vacation and he came home and I was like, dude, this is crazy. And he's like, what are you doing? Like, post another one. I'm like, no, no, I can't. He's like, what are you talking about? Post another one. And then so that day probably posted another one doubled in likes it was like you know 10 15 20 thousand what what explained it how did people even find out about it i don't know that's the power of social media and the power of timing you know the right song the right time of day the stars aligned for just 10 seconds for me to post a video online for it to take off on fire by the way you can still see that video when you watch that video today do you cringe do you <laughs> oh are yeah you proud of it? i hate watching that video okay i, I hate watching any video <laughs> around that time <laughs> So that gets like 10,000 and 20,000. You delete Vine and then I guess you reload it and reload you it. start putting up more. But not just putting them up. I'm putting up three videos a day. That's all I'm doing is, is thinking about Vine and posting videos. But I would do 150 takes of a, of a six and a half second video before I would post it. So what did your parents think when you had like, you know, here's their 15-year-old son in a house? They didn't know (laughs) until I had like 150,000 followers. I remember one day being like, look at this. I have 150,000 followers on this app. What is this? And my parents like not really getting it either and me not getting it. It wasn't until I hit about 300,000, there was a meetup in Toronto, Um, probably around about a month later. and A meetup of who? Viners. American Viners are coming to Toronto for the first time. And they messaged me saying, hey, we'd love you to come. And I said, oh, of course, not thinking, because these guys had, you know, million followers, 800,000 followers at the time. I was just a small Viner, but it was my city, which is obviously things are different there, yeah. you know? And so I, I go down to Dundas Square in Toronto. I remember I'm coming, I'm with a couple of friends. I'm coming up the from the subway into Dundas Square and there's a massive group of people. And I'm thinking, what? I wonder if that's, They all turn around and look at me and immediately recognize me and start running towards me. Just this crowd of people. Yeah. And this is my first time experiencing fan interaction. And there's about 300 people running towards me. Me and my friends turn around and we run straight into the restaurant. The restaurant has to close the doors, lock the doors. You had no idea? Yeah. I had no idea that was what was going to happen. Looking at a number on a phone is very different than seeing 300 people in front of you. And they were like screaming. Yeah, totally. Immediately. And... (laughs) We're all in, I remember we're in this restaurant and I'm there and I'm like, what is going on? And I messaged one of the other Viners and we ended up getting out back out to the crowd and I got on stage and I ended up getting off stage sitting on this like rock and just playing acoustic guitar songs. Were you nervous at all? You'd never performed, right? Of course, shaking and nerves, but it was so exhilarating to, to think that this many people cared. Did people ask for your autograph? Yeah. Was it weird? Photos and... and Because you were like a high school student who was just like coming... It is just as weird as you imagine it. Uh Uh-huh. That's what it is. Every time somebody asks and they go, how crazy is it all this is happening? And I go, imagine it. That's what it is. It's not more confusing than that. There's nothing I know that you don't. It's just crazy. (laughs) So so what happened after that? I went home that night and and I was like to my parents look at this and it was a video of them like chasing me they were like what is this what is going on i said i have no idea what's going on and my dad goes to me do you want to do this for a living and i said well yeah and he goes well can you write music and i was like i don't know he's like go write a song and so i remember that night i went up to my room that night wrote this song i came downstairs i played it for my parents and they're like all right that's pretty awesome you keep doing that do you remember what the song was <laughs> it was called my time Basically me saying this was my time to do my thing. So you're posting these Vine videos. And at this point, are you thinking, I want to be a star. I want to I want to be huge. Did you was that even a kernel of thought in your mind? No, the thought was, how do I make this next Vine video better than the last one? And I think that's like a big lesson that I've learned is like focus on what's right in front of you and make that better than what you did yesterday, because that is the bigger picture, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I guess toward the end of that year, you, a guy named Andrew Gertler co- contacts you. Is yeah. that right? Um, who is your manager today? Which yeah. you mentioned, but 
And he contacted you and said, hey, I'm working for Warner. I want to talk. Yeah. And they had like a little whatever. What is it? Like a trademark thing oh, yeah. in, in the email. Yeah. And, and my parent, my mom was like, this is so legit. Because her email was in my bio. Oh, contact. Yeah. Contact okay. Karen, you know, my mom. Yeah. And she was getting all the emails. And then she was like, this is legit. Like, this is real. And he was like, oh, like, I'd love to Skype with you guys. And we got on Skype with him. And he saw my cover of Say Something, which went mm -hmm. a little bit viral on YouTube. Sure. And he was like, well, I'm in New York. And, you know, I, I, one of my good friends is an a and at Island Records. And he was there too, Ziggy. The chat was, was so cool because it was like the first time he wasn't really, nobody was like really asking for anything. And they said, come to New York, come see yeah. us. He was just like, hey, like, we'll fly you up to New York. Want to come to New York? And my dad and I were like, absolutely, never been. Let's go. We flew out to New York. I remember going to uh, Island Records, which was like my first time ever going to a record label. We're going up the elevator. I go to, to meet David Massey, who is one of my favorite people in the entire world. But at the time, you know, I was just freaking out. I was going to sing for him. You were going to sing for? The president of Island Records. It was you, your dad, and a guitar. And a guitar, Andrew Ziggy, and a few people in, in David's room, and David. And I remember I walked into the room, and I immediately had this connection with him. It was like all of a sudden, everybody else was in the in the room was gone, and it was just me and him. We just kind of hit it off immediately. We laugh about it now, but I always say like we hit it off because he looks resembles my grandfather. He has he kind of looks like my granddad. And I told him that later, and he was like, "Oh, that's so. That's why you were so calm when you came in." What did you sing for him? My time, the original, and then I sang Ed Sheeran A Team and. I messed up like crazy and if it was me signing the kid I probably wouldn't have signed it but for some reason I think they saw something in me that I didn't know that I had and I remember we got on the elevator on the way down and Ziggy is looking at his phone and he goes well uh, they would like to put an offer in to sign you and uh, that that day it was my dad and I were just kind of mind blown and that's when we realized that this is like the real deal. When we come back how that record deal took Shawn Mendes from a social media star to a platinum-selling superstar. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Rewind from Spotify Studios and Built It Productions. Hey, it's Guy Raz here. If you want to check out another Spotify podcast, be sure to listen to Dissect. Each season explores a single album, forensically dissecting the music and lyrics of one song per episode. Past seasons have tackled the music of Kendrick Lamar, Kanye West, and Frank Ocean. And Dissect just launched a new season all about the classic album, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill. Listen to Dissect on Spotify today. Hey, welcome back to The Rewind from Spotify Studios and Built It Productions. I'm Guy Raz. Now, in 2014, when Shawn Mendes signed with Island Records, it's kind of easy to forget, but he was just 15 years old. And even as he started to deal with the music world, with managers and studios and music labels and handlers, he would still get up each morning in Pickering, Ontario, and go to high school. I was in 10th grade. And then, you know, Ziggy sends me an email one day. It's just like, this is right after I, right after I signed. It's this folder with a bunch of records in it, songs. In the folder, there's the song Life of the Party. And I'm listening I, in class. I was in, I think I was in English class and I have my headphones in. And I was telling my teacher, this is so important. Please, miss, like, I, I have to listen to these songs. Like, I need to know. And she's like, okay, fine, fine. The followers, I was probably about at like 800,000 followers at this point. People knew what was going on. And so I was like, I have to listen to the song. So she let me get out of class. I reply back and I'm like, I love this song, Life of the Party. Flew to New York, cut that song that night. And uh, there, the rest is history. So I guess you really start to get to work on your first album over the course of the next year. Yeah. What did you do? How did you, how did you start to write those songs? What, what? Walk me through your process. Uh, I, I loved working with Ito and Scott. Uh, they basically were the two who taught me how to write songs. And Scott Harris is some a writer who I wrote basically most of all my records with. The thing was, is at that moment, they really believed in me. Hmm. And they really taught me how to play guitar and how to, for them, you know, they were so gracious to be able to teach me how to do everything and teach me why this was a good thing to do when you're writing a song and why we can't do this. And it was really awesome. 
over that course of the year, when when you're working on on your first release, you were getting all this attention from people at the record label, and they were investing time in you and all this effort in you. And did you ever have doubts? Did you ever think, God, I these, I, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'm, maybe maybe they think I'm better than I am. Maybe of course, I, yeah, of course. And I think that most ninety percent of people do. I think that's so human. And I remember I had to play Life of the Party on. Uh, a breakfast television show in New York. And I said to my manager, I need a band. I need track. I can't do this on my own. I can barely play guitar. Like, I don't know how to play the song. I had to go meet up with Scott. He had to teach me how to play the song. And I could, I can never thank him enough for this, for being like, no, you're going to stand and you're going to play the guitar just like you did for me. Was that your, the first time you did anything like that? Yeah. And I, and I got on, and I got on this breakfast television show with a mic and my acoustic guitar and I sang the song. And I think, this has been a massive game of proof to myself that, you know, I deserve to be here. And I think that that's kind of what's made it so fun and intense for me and prove to people that it's not just a social media thing, that, yeah. there, that there is real talent behind these things. Um, so you release your first album, your first major yeah, yeah. album in 2015, April 2015, handwritten. It debuts at number one on the Billboard charts. Yeah. What'd you think about that? The album was made so fast. We did an EP. We had to get an album about. It was a mixture of cutting songs and writing songs for the very first time. We're sitting in the vocal booth that Stitches was cut in mm -hmm. right now. Um, and that was on that record. And until that point, I never had a, a radio single, which was a big deal. We tried to push Life of the Party. We tried to push a couple other songs. Nothing was working. And it was getting, I was getting really, you know, worried about that. And then Stitches happened. It went crazy and i got offered the tour to open up for taylor swift this is two years after you post your first vine video yeah you are invited to open up for Taylor Swift on her North America tour. Yeah. You were going to be playing in front Stadiums. of like 50,000 people. With an acoustic guitar. I'd be freaking out. I was freaking out. Yeah. That was another time I had, I had to get a band, I had to get a band. And my manager goes, nope, you're going to do it with an acoustic guitar. Just you, an acoustic guitar, a spotlight, and 50,000 50, people. 50,000 people. First show, I walk out and I don't think, I think like, a hundred people paid attention. Knew who you were. <laughs> yeah. Because they were there to see Taylor Swift. Yeah. And, and and I had fans there, but you know, like it's a Taylor Swift show. Sure. And it was really crazy. You got on stage with acoustic guitar and you're like really thinking, Is, are people paying attention? There was definitely fans paying attention, but majority of the, them weren't looking. Yeah, because the the dynamic of being on stage has a lot to do with the energy that you're getting from the audience. Exactly. Right? The, the, the singing, the clapping, the moving. Everything. The people cheering. Everything. Yeah. It was only about, it was almost around the end of the tour. I remember we're in Chicago. I will never forget this. Stitches really is, it's just, just, I think it maybe, it just got to its peak and it's taking off and everybody really knows what it is and, and everybody's freaking out about it. And I'm on stage in Chicago and for the first time I did this new thing in, in the bridge and Stitches and all of a sudden the crowd, I felt I got goosebumps thinking about it. I felt the energy of the crowd all just go look at me oh. at one moment. And the lighting director on the Taylor Swift show gave me a little bit more light that night. Huh. He gave me this beautiful red beam that went down from me th through the middle of the crowd. And I'll never forget, right when that like beam went down through the crowd was the moment when I realized that Stitches was the thing that was going to take everything next level. And I had only about five or six shows after that. But every show after that, by the time I would get to Stitches at the end of my set, I had the crowd really paying attention. And then the rest was up to me. By the way, when you were on tour with Taylor Swift, did you, did you ever get a chance to interact with her? Um, yeah, a few times. I didn't see her a whole lot, but... She was very gracious, and one day, you know, I, I ran into her, and she goes, how are you feeling? And I got oh, nervous, my, you know, my go-to answer, I'm feeling nervous. Yeah. She goes, why? I said, I don't know, I guess answer is, the truth is I don't want to mess up, and people do think I suck. And she goes, 
everybody out in that audience has come tonight to enjoy the show and have fun. Nobody has come to judge you. No one's out there thinking, all right, I can't wait to judge Sean. They're all here. I can't wait to love Sean, you know, and Taylor. And the second she said that to me, you know, everything changed for me. I got it on the stage and my whole demeanor on stage changed and everything. It was awesome. So you come off the tour with Taylor Swift and you're ready to do your own tour, Sean Mendes. Yeah. And um, it's hard for me to recap everything because it felt like it feels like the biggest blur in the whole world in the best way. And then it felt like I had another six months to make another album and I made the album and then it was just all over again. In this massive spread of time, I just was touring and making music and it was just, we had stitches, the next album comes out and we were lucky to have a song like Treat You Better. That was when I felt a serious, serious shift you um the people that you admire like ed sheeran and john mayer um they all write their own music yeah so walk, walk me through how you write a song let's let's talk about um there's nothing holding me back yeah H- how do you what do you what do you start with do you start with a, a melody, a, melody a phrase like a fragment a line a, a there's no rules and it's different every single time you write a song there's actually no rules i wrote holding me back in my bedroom after the gym one day and i picked up my electric guitar and started belting at the top of my, I, I went in my room and I said I'm gonna sing as high and as, was and it, loud was as I it can. Was it holding me back? Was that was were those words you were singing? No. It was oh yeah she's crazy and na na oh yeah she's crazy oh na na she oh yeah she's crazy huh. over and over again. And I recorded that into a voice note. So you would just come in and you'd start that and you would record it and then what happens next? How does I, that morph? I record this idea and I put it in my notes which has I have fifteen hundred voice notes in my phone. I put it in and I wrote crazy in all capitals. And a few weeks later, I had a session with Scott Harris, Teddy Geiger, and Jeff Warburton. And I pick up the guitar and I was like, I have this thing. And I start yeah. singing it for them. And they're like, that's great. Confess it, yeah. Oh, I've been shaking. I love it when you go crazy. You take all my inhibitions. Baby, there's nothing holding me back. You take me places that tear up my reputation. Manipulate my decisions. Baby, there's nothing holding me back. So it's like you guys are all on a construction site. You're all building piece by piece. It's crazy because you, you start from nothing. You start from zero. And every single time you start from zero. It's not like after you have a few hits, all of a sudden you're starting from a higher vantage point. You're not. It's zero again. Because it has to be original and new. Every time you write a song, it feels like the first time. That's why it's so fun. And, and it's this big game of chasing the feeling of having something that you can listen to over and over and you love and it's yours. Earlier in 2018, um, you released your third record, and um, it was a very different record. I mean, you were you, you have themes on this record that are about your own struggles with anxiety. You wrote, yeah. wrote a song about it in my yeah, blood. Of course, tell me a, about that song. Yeah, I mean, that was the very first song we wrote for the album, and I walked into the studio, and you know, I saw Scott and everyone, and and I said, "How do we beat the last album and the last record?" and for me was to be more authentic and more real and give more of myself than I've ever given before mm-hmm. and tell the truth. And I sat and they were like, so what is the truth? And and at the time I was kind of struggling with anxiety and I said, well, this is the truth, honestly. Like, let's just get as real as we possibly can. And the night I released In My Blood was one of the, the scariest nights I've ever had. I, you know, in my head, I was thinking, oh, people don't want to hear about me complaining. They're going to think I have nothing to complain about. And I remember the song coming out and getting flooded with emails and texts from the song. I mean, I walked into the building today and the door guy basically comes over and shakes my hand. He goes, hi, I just want to let you know, I just moved to LA. My daughter is in Vegas and she was recently diagnosed with a, a very serious disease. And she texted me today and she said, uh, listen to this song. Uh, it's helping me so much. I hope it, I hope it helps you too. And that moment is was so surreal to me and every single time that happens is you know the reason as a songwriter you you talk about the truth and you make an authentic song there's um really powerful imagery in the song you have this this line that says i'm crawling in my in my skin yeah that's a real feeling totally and it's and it's a real feeling for everybody and at one point i'm sure everybody can sort of relate to that you know i was telling my version of how it felt and i think that's the best way i can explain it what do you what do you worry about professionally? Do you feel like I've had all these hits, I've got in my blood it's being played on the radio all the time, youth, all these amazing songs. Um, do you feel like, okay, now I've got to do the next thing, and I gotta do the next thing? Yeah. 
all the time. That's all I think about, actually. It's really terrifying, but so exciting. And for me, you know, there's been moments where I'm thinking, I don't have it, I don't have it. And then somebody will come into my life and they'll inspire me. And all of a sudden, I have wrote it. And there it is. Does it, you know, when you're such a public figure, especially a musician or, a, or an actor, and then you're in L.A., you know, there's paparazzi, there's people asking about your personal life, there are people, if you're holding someone's hand, if you're, yeah. at, you, you, do you always have to be vigilant or do you just not really worry about that stuff? I don't care. I really don't care. Honestly, I think that for me, say what you want to say and decide what you want to decide, because I guess for what it matters is I know the truth. Um, and yeah, and if I really was out with somebody and holding their hand, obviously there was a reason I was holding their hand. I'm not, and I've, I don't really feel like I have anything to hide. Um, so yeah, I don't care. But maybe I'll come back in a couple of years and be saying something different. <laughs> yeah. You have a long career ahead of you. I hope so. Um, I mean, is there somebody that you really want to collaborate with that you want to perform with? I would love to really, I really would love to work with Lisa Keys. I think she's just everything in a great human that exists. And uh, she's so funny. I got to work with her. I was co-hosting on a show called The Voice and she was just really, really funny. Super funny. And who who are you listening to nowadays? Um, I'm listening to everyone. I obviously just started listening to the new Drake album. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, music is so accessible that in the morning, you're listening to Kanye West, and in the afternoon, you're listening to John Mayer, and then at night, you're listening to Top 40 Radio, and it just doesn't matter anymore. So it's just like mm -hmm. everyone. You mention Ed Sheeran a lot yeah. as somebody who inspired you, and really, you wanted to be Ed Sheeran. You didn't yeah. necessarily want to be a huge star. You wanted just you just yeah. loved his music, right? I met Ed before I even released my first single because uh, Andrew's friends with you know his publicist at the time. Uh -huh. And he goes, what do you want to do? And I said, virtually, I want to be you. <laughs> and he goes, okay, can you work as hard as me? And I was like, I don't know. I, I, I'm like 15 at the time. I just watched him perform on The Voice. And he goes, if you want to be successful, you have to work so hard and you have to never say no to a radio interview. You have to never say no to somebody wanting to take a photo. You have to never say no because you're tired. Because if you want to be successful, you have to work harder than every single other person. Wow. And that sticks with me every day. I wish he knew how many times I wake up and I'm like, wow, I'm tired today. And he, all of a sudden I hear Ed go, oh, well, you want to be me? And then I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then, so he's, and then after that, you know, we went and met every radio station in the city, you, in the country. You did say yes. Of course. And that was when a big thing changed for me. And every single radio station, I saw his face on the wall with a signature. <laughs> Almost like he was looking, like making he sure was I was there. Up. Yeah. And, uh, I really truly believe that like talent and and a good song and good timing can only get you so far but when it really comes down to it you have to work your ass off to get to where you want to be. 